Hi, I'm Nathan Pierce from Prosimo. Thank you for joining this event titled, You Are Doing MCN Wrong. We're gonna provide some valuable insights into how to do it right, how to avoid many of the pitfalls that can get you into this wrong space. And we've got a couple of experts with us today who are gonna help us along this discussion. Um, first, David Linthicum, please introduce yourself to our audience. Yeah, Dave Linthicum, Chief Cloud Strategy Officer at Deloitte. I just authored a book called uh, uh, Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing. I do the InfoWorld blog, uh, do a lot of writing and speaking about cloud computing and pontificating about the future of this stuff and how to make it work for your enterprise. Magnificent. And Ramesh Prabhagaran? Hey, uh, Ramesh Prabhagaran, CEO of, uh, of Prosimo, uh, all things uh, multi-cloud networking, which will be the topic of conversation today. It's quite a lot of expertise. Great, great stuff. Thanks, guys. Well, let's start with, um, I mean, what, what's the current status of cloud? Where are people at? What's the, what's going on in the industry? Yeah, so let me let me take a, a minute to of kind of zoom into the topic here, right? Uh, you're doing MCN wrong is a very strong statement. Some might even think it's a little obnoxious, uh, but it's there for a reason. Enterprises, big and small, hundreds of them that we have talked to, uh, and David probably in the thousands, um, all grapple with the right approach to cloud networking, leave alone multi-cloud networking, cloud networking, right? You have folks that think cloud networking should be about building highways. You have some that are more application oriented, and there are a whole lot of considerations underneath the covers as well, right? And so um, we hope to demystify this today. Uh, and no better person to be doing this than with uh, with David here. Thank you. Awesome. So with that, uh, Nathan, maybe we uh, move to the uh, uh, to the next slide. So when you talk to cloud networking folks, um, they belong in different organizations inside the enterprise, and that's important because it gives you some focus as to where they start. Um, some think about cloud networking as building highways. So I need to go from one cloud region to another, or I need to go from one VPC to another, or I need to go from one cloud to another. And so the role and the problem seems to be about building highways. Um, if you talk to the cloud platform teams and the cloud networking folks inside of that, uh, it seems to be a whole lot focused on apps, users, and services. Solve kind of this infrastructure problem, which underneath the covers has networking security and all the wonderful operations uh, underneath, but solve it for the applications I care about first. And then as you add more applications, build enough infrastructure underneath the cover. So almost it's infrastructure as a means to an end, as opposed to in the former case, it is about kind of the core focus, right? David, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how uh, your customers and, and, and clients that you talk to, kind of how do they think about this? Well, they don't think about it in in, in uh, good structured ways. I think, which, like you just you kind of did a great job in kind of framing the problem. Ultimately, this really becomes something that's strategic to your success of cloud computing and certainly multi cloud. And it's not really considered that way. Everything really is a bunch of little battles that end up building the network, and you know, different uh, um, purpose built links in between the various systems, different segments, different ways of managing the subdomains and doing identity access management, network security in different ways. And so they end up with a not necessarily uh, a problem with making a ton of mistakes, but they have a complexity issue that they can't get around. So it's not bespoke for their particular purposes. So in other words, they're trying to do everything themselves. Uh, everything is just building on top of building on top of building. It becomes very much a spaghetti project unto itself to the point where many are just kind of hitting the brakes and saying, we need to do something differently here because this multi-cloud networking system we have in place won't scale. Absolutely. No, spot on. And uh, and Nathan, if you move to the, to the next slide, kind of the double click on that, right? And I found it very interesting when talking to different teams inside of an enterprise, big or small, right? Uh, the cloud teams start with applications, right? If you start with the infrastructure, you lose them. Uh, you kind of start with the, the applications, right? And, and what they care about and goals, MBOs, everything is all tied to speed of operations, right? The CIO cares about speed of operations, mm -hmm. move, reason to move to the cloud also is, is that kind of agility, speed of operations, all of that, right? And then you have the network and the, and the security uh, folks, it could be part of the same team, 
uh, it are tuned to building really robust, reliable infrastructure with all the right performance. Um, some just build highways. Some say, hey, you know what? I need to build highways with lanes and I need to have like fast lanes and slow lanes. I need to make sure like I have toll gates uh, that provide the security and, and so on and so forth. And so it's fascinating to see different care about, but all coming together. right? And so uh, the question again, David, I would have is, um, is it that both are equally important? Uh, is one more important than the other? How, what, what would you recommend to folks kind of building out infrastructure almost from, from the ground up? Yeah, it's really, you work from your requirements into the solution. Uh, at the end of the day. And I, I think where if we put, uh, you know, a quality of importance on each one of these things and, uh, you know, even I, I love the way you talk about care about people who are, you know, responsible for certain systems there. Everybody has their own, in essence, priorities that may be conflicting in terms of how you're getting to the ultimate optimized architecture. You got to remember, that's what we're going for here. And this is not about just building something that works, we can probably get networking stuff up and works and have a big spaghetti issue and operational complexity problems that we just talked about. But this is about building something that approaches will never hit 100% optimization and your ability to support the networking. So the ability to have dynamic behaviors, the ability to put volatility into a domain, and the ability to scale up to particular systems that are there. So I always just warn people that you know, this is not about necessarily doing things the way that your close competitors are doing or what you did at a previous company. This is, in essence, dynamically looking and reinventing the way in which we're doing networking for multi-cloud deployments because it's a new problem domain. We've kind of never seen this before. And the reality is we need to think differently in how we look for outcomes here. They're going to be more viable and also more optimized. Awesome. No, that's, that's a great segue, uh, David, as well into... What causes this problem, right? Like it, we can say each team kind of cares about different things and they all need to operate and coexist together. That's, that's probably trivial. Uh, but what causes this problem, right? And so uh, we always, when we have these customer conversations, especially the first one or two calls where there are kind of considered discovery, where we are learning more about kind of the, the customer's environment and so forth, we always leave with what is the commonality that we, that we see here, right? And so Nathan, if you go to the, the next one, uh, let's kind of double click on what we think are the sources of the of the problem. And so this is coming kind of from what we have seen, David, I'd love to hear your views as well on, hey, you know what, like some of these are a real problem, some of these are not, uh, and these are like the other things that we should be talking about uh, as well. So uh, Nathan, if you move to the next slide, uh, there are potentially five things uh, that we have seen as commonality, not in any particular order or priority, but the one that always intrigues us is, application diversity. Uh, back to David, what you mentioned, which is we're operating in a new world, right? Uh, the apps might have migrated from data center into the public cloud, but they are not standalone. Uh, you have other things around it that you need as well, right? And so it could be, hey, there is a, 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 a core flagship application I have moved, but that's going to talk to a database here, and that's going to talk to a cloud native uh, structure somewhere. And even within that, I have like API gateways, I have serverless functions and this, that, and the other. And it is not one single application anymore. It is a collection of things that achieve a certain outcome, right? And so uh, we made the mistake, I would say, early days of proceeding on asking the customer, how many applications do you have? Some would give us an answer in like the thousands. And they're like, why on earth would you have like thousands of these applications that you have built, right? And then they would just start with, hey, here's kind of the core application. And it's like, oh, that's not one. It, it has like all these 15 different tentacles that it's talking to. And each of those tentacles are talking to like 15 different things and then so forth. So um, the application diversity is one uh, that particularly intrigues because I, I, having come from kind of this SD1 uh, world in the past, I always thought of applications as kind of group of IPs, right? And that's it. Like if I take care of how do you get from one point to another, my problem is done. But in the cloud world, it's not. It is a whole lot more, right? An API gateway interacts very differently than a serverless Lambda function, with very different than kind of a service mesh, uh, different than like an S3 bucket and, and so forth. Uh, how do you, how do you kind of make sense of this application diversity problem? Is there a way to kind of think of this uh, in, in the right way, David? 
Yeah, I like to think of it, and I tell my clients to think of it this way in terms of factorial. And so if we have different cloud providers uh, that are there and different platforms that are there and things like that, everything's going to be pretty much in terms of iteration and patterns, uh, three, four, sometimes five factorial of the number of things that exist in different configurations for different purposes. And we've gotten there probably by making many mistakes and not having common architectures, things like that. And I, I don't think this is about shaking, wagging your finger at somebody in terms of past architectures, but really kind of considering what the value of your as is state is going to be in terms of the complexity mediation and how you're going to deal with networking in such a way where it's going to be reusable components don't ne aren't necessarily things that you build. I think we got to get out of that that uh, framework and looking at different kind of, uh, um, you know, better optimized solutions to make this happen. So this is about realizing that you have a problem. Uh, this is realizing what the current solution kind of looks like. And this realizes in terms of you're getting application diversity under control. And the best thing to do would be mediation of this complexity system by doing so at the networking layer. Absolutely. No, wonderful. And, and I think the, the, a problem that's really closely associated with that is choosing the center of gravity. Um, and unfortunately, it's not something that you choose and it sticks there, right? And with the whole migration that has kind of already happened into the public cloud and some still staying back in the data center and it's going to be this hybrid world for, for quite some time, um, the starting point matters where you have on one end, systems that have been built over decades in the in the data center, um, colo space and, and whatnot. And then you have public cloud, which is fairly, I would say not new, uh, but it's not a decade old either, right? And so uh, your center of gravity as to where your applications are gonna reside really, really matters. And uh, we've seen many customers grapple with, hey, I, I choose like one cloud as my center of gravity. And so everything else, and it has to fall in place based on that, which means I might have to cut corners on the other things. And some say, no, 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 my data center is my center of gravity, public cloud is an extension of that. And so I look at the problem very differently. Um, is, there a, is there a right way to approach this problem, David, in your view? Yeah. Yeah, I think I like the center of gravity aspect of it. But the thing is, you, you have to remember that we're trying to not force fit things into ways in which that cloud providers are doing things. And so cloud providers have a tendency to be their own world gardens. They don't really think kind of outside of their domain. So you as an architect, and specifically a network architect, needs to kind of understand how all these things really kind of come together and some of the common patterns that are going to be you know, part of the particular cloud computing domain, but in essence, they're a logical layer that sits above the clouds. I mean, this was whole super cloud, meta cloud movement that's going on. When you think about it, it's the ability to look at cross cloud services. In this case, we're talking about networking with the ability to, in essence, reduce the number of moving parts and reduce the operational complexity of these things by putting these things in there. And I think that's where people are kind of missing the boat. They're, they're going to be like, I want to do everything the way AWS does or Google or Microsoft, that's not the answer. How do you want to leverage these systems? And you have to understand that, you know, over time, applications may be modal across various systems and your ability to kind of host those things without, you know, getting a religion around a particular cloud provider and how they do it uh, is really going to be things that you need to you need to kind of push against right now to get to something that, again, is going to be in a much more optimized state and is provable via metrics. So in other words, we're going for something that's good for us. We're not going for something that's good for a particular cloud provider. That's awesome. No, that's great. Actually, early days of the, of the company, we drew a, a nice matrix of here are all the services that are offered by one cloud provider in a single region. And then we had another column that said, if I extend to another region, kind of these are the things that work, these are the things that don't. And if I extend this to another cloud, here are the things that work, work differently, sometimes work completely differently and so forth. And when we zoom out and look at that table, that table had a lot of holes, right? Like it works in one way, in this way, and that way. And so we were like, oh my God, this is, this is like complexity right here, right? Even if I want to bring in a dozen of these applications and want them to talk to each other, it, is, it just gets very complex very quickly. And so, um, and, and furthermore, if I kind of bring my data center stack into the mix, then I have like a, a bloat here and in the cloud, obviously, at the end of the month, you nice get a nice fat bill and people go crazy after that. Right? And so it's, it's an interesting 
kind of balance uh, uh, balance as well. Yeah, this, is about, to the, to the next this is about doing, thing on your t doing things on your terms, not the terms of the technology. Yeah, exactly. And I can't stress that enough. People have a tendency, if they do stuff on the terms of the technology, they're going to get to a complexity state because everybody's going to have their own unique solutions for solving particular problems, whether it's networking, data infrastructure, operational infrastructure, governance, security. Those layers need to be owned by you and configured by you using whatever technology that you're going to need to be successful. Absolutely. And, and David, uh, and Nathan, if you move to the, to the next slide, <clears throat> David, I know the, just organizationally, uh, one thing comes to mind, as, as you mentioned that, right, which is we've seen some customers go down the path of, hey, you know what, I'm going to design for my tech cloud, and then I'm going to kind of optimize for all the, all the things that are unique to a specific cloud, use cloud mm -hmm. native wherever necessary, uh, but I'm going to design for my tech cloud. Um, some that have kind of cloud center of excellence teams uh, have kind of fragmented approaches to this, right? Hey, I have these kind of customer facing workloads uh, that are in one cloud. Maybe my internal listen is in a different cloud or have acquired like big companies that are in a different cloud and they're trying to make sense of it all, right? Um, interesting, interesting times where kind of just different uh, organization structures also lead to quite a bit of that uh, that complexity, right? Which, uh, which brings us to kind of number three, which is, um, we, we see enough unsolved problems, uh, whether it's kind of networking, security, uh, or whatnot, within a single region. Uh, in the confines of, of networking, let's say that is, I, I, I get like all the raw ingredients to put things together to make sure that, let's say, two applications can talk to each other. Uh, but let's take the case of, uh, of a merges and acquisitions where two companies come together and I have like overlapping IPs, right? Like who solves for that? Or it could be, uh, I have credit card transactional traffic that needs to go through and I want to pick only those things and send them through kind of a security stack, right? And so I need like advanced capabilities, uh, which we have seen many of our customers employers for uh, essentially kind of that super cloud layer and, and so forth. And when you go from one region to another and then uh, obviously go to go to multi-cloud, the problem compounds itself, right? Um, so back to what you mentioned, David, which is solve for kind of your care abouts and then pull the uh, the right techniques. Uh, there's a, a big sandwich in the middle uh, and the size of that sandwich varies largely. Like where, where do I go use cloud native? What do I have to do that is kind of abstracted away? Do you have a, a crystal ball for kind of how to think about that? Yeah, um, ultimately, this is about looking at common architecture patterns and where things are emerging. So one of the things we're going to get in trouble if we do, again, is looking at particular ways that applications are deployed and operated. We need to consider that, but all, on moving forward, we're looking for common patterns where we can remove some of the moving parts. So we're going to have a diversity of applications you just mentioned. We're going to have a diversity of cloud providers, at least the big three and most of the major organizations out there. And so like 98% right now that we're seeing in the market, they may use one over the other, but also additional private cloud systems, sovereign cloud systems that really gets nuts in terms of the ability to kind of reach these various things. So we need to stop thinking in terms of how we're doing something at the domain level. That needs to be removed from the conversation. It has to have common sets of services and how we're going to reuse those services. Because right now we just have too many moving parts. It doesn't mean we can't make something that looks like spaghetti code, you know, run for a certain amount of time. If you throw enough money and resources and people at it, you know, it's going to work for a certain period of time, but you're increasing security risk, you're lowering performance. And the big thing, you're also lowering the monetary, come the, the business value that comes back from this particular implementation. You got to remember now we're, we're going into a bit of a downturn. And the thing I'm keep hearing out there is optimization, optimization, optimization. And so if we're looking at network optimization, what ways do we view the various systems and network design where we're looking at common patterns so we're not necessarily reinventing the wheel and resolving problems over and over again and the reality is we got into cloud computing doing that and we're at a point right now in a complexity and there's a name for it right now called the complexity wall and the network complexity wall where it's impeding growth so we need to start figuring out how to dig ourselves out of the hole and one thing i don't want to do is keep digging. So in other words, what stop, what commonalities are there, different architectural patterns, best practices need to be looked at, and also enabling technology that's going to get you there. I don't think people are aware that lots of different networking technology is out there that they can employ to kind of take exactly. things to the next level. No, an interesting thing, I, I was in a recent customer conversation uh, with a large manufacturer that said, hey, I like all the multi-cloud things that you're talking about, but I have a specific problem. They said, 
my IAM and IDP lives in one region. Uh, it's Azure AD. <clears throat> I have a BigQuery service that needs to pull data from an S3 bucket. It's like, solve that problem for me. Like, awesome, right? Like, I, I can't build big highways and expect that you will like trickle in traffic between those things. They said, these are your three endpoints. Solve this problem for me. Right? And as seemingly simple that is, uh, these are the, the realities of what customers live in. Right? Because you have BigQuery, an awesome service. S3, really awesome service. And Azure AD providing probably the, 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 the premier IDP service. You got to make those three things work. Uh, unfortunately, they live in three different clouds. Uh, and so you have to kind of bring, bring it all together. Uh, that's, that's, a great, that's a great point that you bring up uh, there, David. Um, now, shifting gears a little bit to kind of the operational stack here, right? Uh, one of the, the CIOs we were talking to recently said, hey, I have two approaches to operations. <clears throat> said, on one end, uh, I can get um, a 20 year old uh, um, team of people and they'll automate the heck out of it, right? They'll, They'll, they'll terraform everything. They know how to kind of pull infrastructure as code. They'll automate it. But if I look underneath the covers, the networking principles required there is going to be really bad. Then he said, I can get like a double CCIE who has really sound networking principles. They'll build a super robust networking infrastructure, but it'll be lacking completely in automation. So he's like, help me, <laughs> help me bridge the two here. Right? Um, what have you seen work, uh, David, here on kind of the whole... Uh, star DevOps mentality and, and to what extent as well. I think there's, there's a big slider bar uh, where you can really go too much into the weeds as well. Yeah, everybody wants to move to the left and then move to the right and move back to the left again. <laughs> and I, I think the reality, I, I think the reality is and kind of you hit the nail on the head is we have to look at this that's going to be part of a more holistic infrastructure. We have a tendency within the whole DevSecOps world to uh, kind of operate in digital drum circles and operate within pods without a good understanding of where the core services need to be, you know, where networking systems, data systems, security systems, all these sorts of things. We can't stop, we can't start doing that over and over again and expect to get out of the complexity issues that we're dealing with. So we need to think strategically as we're building these applications, we need to have, and DevSecOps is about communications in between these various humans and systems, which we're able to put together a layer of understanding in terms of how we're gonna move to commonality within the particular domain. And I just think so often it's, there's missed opportunities in doing that. We had a tendency when DevSecOps first started, they said, great, we don't have to listen to anybody. We can just go ahead and build things using whatever best debris technology we need to take things to the next level. That got us into a bit of trouble. And the reality is it's about not only providing uh, services that people are able to leverage, but common services that, that, quite frankly, the dev teams don't have to think about. So they don't have to think about networking anymore because that problem is solved for them because they're through some sort of a, of a, of a technology that's able to be configured and reconfigured for their exact needs versus them reinventing the network stack and the data stack and the security stack every time they push applications out. And developers don't want to do that either. They want to focus on building code and solving business problems, and that's what we want them to do. So this is about thinking a bit differently. Yes, absolutely. That's wonderful. wonderful. Um, uh, Nathan, if you move on to, to the next one, <clears throat> we can't not talk about cloud networking without talking about cost. Um, and and I, I picked this picture up from the Duck Bill group. Uh, very simple picture, not to pick on uh, AWS here. I'm sure the Azure and GCP and all the other cloud providers have a, have a similar picture. How do... You can see that all the arrows are pointing out. Um, they're not pointing in. Um, so it's really come in for free, uh, leave out. I'm, I'm going to tax you of sorts, right? Um, I think the the more we have this conversation, especially in this current climate with uh, with the enterprises, the more you realize that people think of this as probably like two different arrows. Oh, if I go out the public way, um, then I pay X, and if I go the the private way, I pay Y. But it's not. It is by service, by type, by region, uh, by access mechanism, and where do you go from X to, to Y? How do you consider all this when designing a system? Right? It, it's imp from the lens of, a, of an application person, they probably sit in one of those bubbles. Um, and maybe at best, they can comprehend what does this mean for the bubble that's sitting right next to me. From the lens of a cloud platform guy, this is madness. Um, how do you how, how to make sense of this, uh, David? What do you recommend? 
Yeah, you model this in terms of uh, FinOps standards and practices. In other words, you you would put this into uh, a tool sometimes or just even do it on a, an Excel spreadsheet because this is many instances that we're just discovering an instance of a cost issue and looking holistically about how all these things interact and work one to another. And so there's so many dependencies here and certainly egress costs are going to be a, a key a key there, but also intra-cloud movements and as well as the intra-cloud movements between Amazon and Microsoft, things like that. And you have to model what those things do at a particular level of operation and as you scale them up. So in other words, once you create your model, okay, what does this look like at 100 transactions a minute? What does it look like at 1,000 transactions a minute? And you'll find that the costs are actually not uh, linear. Uh, they're going to change because the behaviors of the applications are going to change and how much, uh, how, many, how much data is pushed around the very intercloud, intercloud, uh, back to the data center, you know, even back to mobile devices, things like that. So this is something that's very dynamic and it's very complex. And I think people have a tendency to underestimate what this is because they just put something together. They thought that cloud was going to be, you know, very cost effective, certainly more cost effective than the on-premise systems. Well, lo and behold, in 2022, everybody got the bad news by getting huge cloud bills that are well above what they were spending with their on-premise systems or on-premise networking. And the reality is there was just a mismanagement and misunderstanding and how these things are designed and how to optimize the efficiencies of moving various systems. So we're asking the question, why am I moving information out of the cloud at this point? What purpose is it? What are alternatives that are there? And by the way, one application has dependencies on uh, 20 different databases that are located and distributed all over the world. What latency impact and cost impact is coming from that? And really kind of looking at the architecture in terms of efficiency, which I don't think we did. We People just threw things together you know, willy nilly. And again, the, their battle cry would be, well, it works. Yeah, I understand it works, but it's costing you a million dollars more a month uh, than it really should be. And so let's do some re-engineering, some optimization. Let's deal with your network differently and let's bring things into uh, in, into light. So people don't understand the complexity when they model it, they do. And they understand that the different levels of scaling, the complexity is going to increase the dynamics of their, of their, of their impact to cost. Two, two things you mentioned, uh, David, in this that particularly caught my attention. One is kind of this FinOps, right? I and mean, we've increasingly seen kind of conversations happening with FinOps teams. Even when I, I was talking to my sales teams, and like, why are you talking to a FinOps guy? And then realized this is why, right? And so uh, what is the right time for kind of enterprises to employ um, such, a, such a FinOps team? Probably not too early. Uh, obviously, if it's too late, then that person is going to be doing damage control for the most part. But how, what is the right time to kind of bring such such a model into place? Yeah, I, I would build it into the initial architectures, even though you may not have a FinOps team there. There has to be a coordination in dealing with FinOps. Same thing with security and governance. You should be systemic to everything you do. So financial understanding, financial operations, cost optimization, all these sorts of things should be considered in the architecture at the very beginning. And by the time you get a FinOps team in place, then we have a good understanding as to what we're moving and building is going to be at, at close to a uh, close to 100% cost efficient as we can before it goes into an operational state. And then they can make the changes and make shifts and adjustments based on new things that we understand. But the mistake was that there was not an understanding in terms of what the cost impact of this is going to be. They understood that uh, certain bucket sizes cost this amount and certain processors cost this amount and all those sorts of things, egress costs this amount, but there was no understanding in terms of how their applications and data is going to behave in the context of those models. And I think really it has to be built in from the beginning. So, you know, as an architect, I'm an architect by trade. I'm always thinking about cost efficiencies in building things into the system. And I'm always doing some back of the napkin cost analytics in terms of what's going to cost me and looking at different options and things like that. I can come up with something that's very technology elegant. In other words, it looks great, very simplistic, uh, but it, it could cost me a million dollars more a month and therefore it doesn't make sense to do that. So you have to kind of look at those trade-offs through all this stuff. And because it's actually worse than on-premise, because once we make the on-premise investment, it's already sunk. Exactly. Uh, we're not getting ding for it. We're getting utility bills right now, very much like uh, you know, running your electricity uh, you know, too much that are coming back with some very rudimentary mistakes that were made just in kind of the cost modeling. Uh, absolutely. Now we were talking to a, a global transportation company um, that is kind of primarily US based, uh, but their kind of core cloud team is out in Europe. And if you look at where the workloads are, uh, they are in Europe, they're not in, in the US, right? And so there's absolutely no bearing for kind of where your customers are. It was just, hey, 
my my team is in Europe, and so they picked uh, uh, EU uh, EU London. Right? I was like, wow, that's an awesome choice right there. So <laughs> awesome. So I think we've, we've spent uh, probably about 20, 25 minutes or so on kind of problems and what got us here. Uh, obviously, we need to. Um, spend a bit more on kind of what's going to get out of this. And so we, we're thinking of a framework uh, here, and Nathan, if you go to the, to the next slide, uh, what should the approach be? And importantly, kind of double click on each, each of those things. So if we go to the stack picture, uh, Nathan. So we, we tend to think of cloud networking in layers. So it just helps mentally create a picture as to kind of what to focus on, right? Um, you have kind of the, uh, the basic transport, connectivity, whatnot, um, where you, you, you leverage probably billions of investment dollars uh, that the cloud providers have made into kind of building constructs and putting them together. You don't want to reinvent the wheel there. Uh, and this is where we have seen kind of appliance versus cloud nature really kind of make, uh, make, make a material difference. Yeah. The foundational MCN connectivity to us is just, can I, can I kind of attach my VPCs, VNets, uh, my workloads, all to kind of native constructs provided by the cloud provider, but then after that, it starts to get a lot more interesting. Um, I have to go down the path of uh, cloud native networking. I'd love to hear kind of how you think about cloud native. Uh, then I have diversity of applications, uh, different uh, workloads, some kind of IP based, some kind of FQDNs and, and kind of layer seven HTTPS, uh, some uh, resource cloud native pass services, whatnot, and then bring the whole operations mindset and the security and performance. So we think, trying to think of this in layers, but I'm sure, uh, David, uh, this, you, you, you've had a picture, you've been, probably been preaching this for like over a decade. Uh, what, what would go uh, into that picture if you were looking at it from the, from the lens of infrastructure? I think ultimately, um, really kind of commonality of services across the various systems. You look at the foundational MCM con connectivity, but you would look at a layer of commonality in terms of how you're going to integrate the various stacks. So how cloud networking uh, communicates with apps and pass and databases. That would, data would be a part of this, by the way, should be a part of this. Net, net DevOps and security and performance. And so, again, it's trying to push things as much as we can down to a common layer, down to a set of commonality. Uh, which is going to be part of the stack, but it's going to be a candidate for things that we can do in a less redundant way across the domains. And that's the only thing. I, this stack actually looks pretty good to me. Okay, awesome. So now I'm going to ask a few questions that uh, I'm sure are, are quite controversial terms. So David, if you move to the sorry, Nathan, if you move to the to the next uh, slide, what does cloud native mean to you? I have not found one consistent answer probably in like ten people that I speak to. So what is cloud? And I know you had a recent blog as well. I'm sure this is kind of top of mind for you. So. Uh, what does cloud native mean to you, David? Yeah, cloud native means the ability to kind of leverage uh, open systems, containerization, and orchestration to build systems that are going to be able to get up to a cloud scale. At least that's the more common services. And if you look at what the cloud native foundation is, that kind of that's what the the role that they go by. It's obviously a bit confusing because you think of cloud native systems, things that run on only a particular cloud provider, they think of it a bit differently. So you have to kind of watch and make sure you define that for you know, somebody who's using it. This is about the ability to not only build systems that are going to be more at cloud scale, but also build systems that are able to run in and between the various cloud providers out there. I'm not talking about being portability one to another, but we're moving up into a federated world where different applications and different containers are going to run on different cloud providers. We may move those from time to time based on the efficiencies we just talked about. I can move it, run it cheaper on, on AWS than I can on Microsoft and vice versa. But this is about building for a layer that's going to operate logically above the clouds. Obviously, the, the applications and the databases operate within the clouds. That's the platforms that they run on. But this is about a different way of thinking. So we think in terms of federated processing, federated database management, and the ability to build applications that are independent of the particular cloud deployments that are out there. So if we're moving into multi-cloud, uh, the last thing in the world is we want to start building things within these walled gardens where they can't move and participate outside of these walled gardens, at least not participate for a lot of, uh, uh, for a lot of money, additional systems. So this is really kind of a better way of dealing with architecture. This is really kind of a more clean way of thinking about how these various systems and those applications, if they're built correctly, uh, they're going to cost a little bit more to develop. They're going to bring a lot more value back to the business. So that's kind of what cloud native means. And it Got is it. a confusing term. I wrote a blog just to 
okay, here's what it, I've, I've heard these definitions, and but this is the one we're going with. Awesome. No, that's great. And, and David, how do you balance that out? Because we live in a hybrid world, um, cloud native in a in an on-prem slash data center slash colo, whichever it is, non-cloud location. What does cloud native mean on a non-cloud location? Does it mean the same thing that uh, you just you just mentioned, or do we have to think about it differently? I, I think it does mean it's similar things in terms of we're building cross systems that are not only uh, going across clouds, but cross mobile computing, IoT edge computing, uh, and even on-premise systems. One of the things I tell people who are building this stuff, if you're just solving this problem for your multi-cloud that goes across two or three different public clouds, you're not necessarily getting the value out of the solution that you can. So in other words, if you're redoing the network, you're redoing your database scheme, the metadata management, security, all these sorts of things, they need to extend to the existing legacy systems that are under control. And obviously there's limitations in doing that in many instances, but they should also extend to the edge-based systems and also extend to the IoT-based systems, the micro clouds, the sovereign clouds, all these things that are out there. And you get really good at adding these additional platforms that may come to light as a best of breed technology. You're going to have way more value you're able to generate than just you know kind of living in a particular domain of just public cloud providers. So am I, if, if you say your, your multi-cloud is just your public cloud providers, not private, edge, mobile computing, and, and on-premise, you're not solving all of your problems and you need to consider that. Absolutely, no, that's, that's a great idea. And, and certainly edge computing uh, and also IoT brings a, a layer of complexity and, and importantly scale um, that requires a whole lot more modeling, right? If we were thinking about kind of right-sizing and co-locating applications to optimize for, for kind of FinOps and, and efficiency there, um, Edge and, and I have to bring a, a layer of complexity that is, is, is boggling. So uh, interesting times we live in, and I'm sure uh, there's, a, there's, there's a lot more uh, on top of this that will get built. So um, moving to the, to the next topic, uh, another controversial term uh, is, is full stack, right? Full stack, again, means many things to, to many people. Um, we kind of started uh, Prosimo because we saw this need for a, for a full stack. I'll give you my, my view and love to hear your, uh, your view as well. Um, a, an IP endpoint, uh, a layer seven kind of HTTPS servers, a gRPC servers, an S3 bucket and a Lambda function are very different. It's just, it's just the nature of the beast. It's very different, right? And so how you deal with one cannot be the same um, as how you deal with the, with the other. Yeah. In the networking world, we used to have this luxury that I will build highways and what goes on top, I really don't care. I just prioritize one versus the other, right? That was the, that was the thing. But in the cloud world, it's very different. Um, you have different apps that behave differently. You have different care about some, some are ephemeral, some are kind of transient, some are highly transactional and, and so on and so forth. And so we, we saw approaches to solving this problem where you would bring kind of a, a solution to solve network database and then you'll bring another solution on top that kind of bridges the application networking uh, to kind of what is required on the, on the services front and then you'll bring another layer on top and and on top and top is became like a seven eight layer sandwich right and so we said no that it can't be because you'll as a, as a cloud team you'll kind of just have these uh, these initiators that just go on for years and you will not solve solve the problem so there is needs to be a, a different way of looking at it is kind of keep the application in the center of the universe, see what it needs, and then only bring enough infrastructure underneath the covers. It could run the gamut from kind of network all the way up the application, but that's that's the nature of the, of the beast, right? What does full stack mean to you, uh, David? It means the ability to not have limitations on particular platform characteristics. And so, in other words, if I'm looking at the full stack, I'm looking at everything that's inclusive of building an application, including the data layer, the networking layer, the security layer, all these sorts of things. And we're not putting limitations or putting things into particular domains unto itself. And so one of the things we need to do as architects, and really kind of you look at what full stack development is, it's really just good architecture at the end of the day. But the ability to deal with applications on their terms using your terms, your ability to look at how that application works and plays well with other components, other databases, other applications, and not necessarily deal with them on the way that they want to be dealt with, with their only their API stacks and their networking layers and things like that. But look holistically in terms of how you're going to deal with it. So we have consistent and common layers that run across these various systems, which allow us to bring to the next level and also provide uh, economy, our, our value through the economies of, of leveraging things that are more holistic, that are transformable across the different platform layers. And, and who, 
typically in a, in a large enterprise, I'm sure you, you, <laughs> you can appreciate this. You have clash of the of the titles and you have clash of the uh, of the approaches, right? Uh, who owns kind of this this approach to solving this problem, uh, David, or who should own? I, I think ultimately it's going to be uh, it's going to be if there's an architect there, you know, someone who's making core decision, and that's typically going to be a large organization. It's going to be a team of people, people I talk to all the time. So they're working with different layers and different teams to make decisions in terms of how they're going to influence commonality uh, and different ways of doing things within the layer. And one of the things I said, as we mentioned, just be redundant. We kind of get out of the, or we need to get out of the habit of building teams around particular platform instantiations. That's not going to work and it's not going to scale. So there does need to be common command and control within the environment, whether that's VP of cloud or you know, uh, you know, know, networking infrastructure supervisor, whatever. It doesn't really matter who they're called. But a team of people needs to have a call to make sure that we're making the right decisions in terms of how we're building stuff. Now, lots of people have, a, have a, the ability to put in input, and this can't be a design by committee thing. But the common command and control is something that's necessary, I think, for building these systems. We've kind of fallen out of that for probably some good reasons. But we need to fall back into it because we're we're not we're operating independently one to another. There's not a lot of common coordination, and we're not building stuff with full stack characteristics. Oh, awesome, uh, Nathan. If you move to the next picture, uh, is a there's a logical extension to what uh, you just mentioned, uh, David. So, from a technology stack standpoint, you have like a few care about and a few bunch more. You mentioned data and, and so forth. Uh, you bring all that together. Um, now there is a, a core team. Uh, in, involved in here, uh, what and and that evolves also based on the scale and the level of maturity, cloud maturity of the, of the company. Um, in in your experience, uh, David, how have you seen this evolve? Right, like what is the small core team that starts to make these meaningful decisions when you are early to cloud, and how does that evolve over time? Anything, anything you can um, you can share there? Yeah, it evolves through credibility. Uh, if they're not credible and they don't have, it's not a, you know, it's not a rank and autocratic, you know, kind of reporting operation. So there has to be a degree of credibility where they're going to become a resource. It's going to make everybody's jobs a bit easier. If they don't pass that, then they're not going to really get any kind of power, any kind of value to make these centralized decisions. So this doesn't come from making someone in charge and it's my way or the highway. That's not right to do it. But somebody that has number one, a complete understanding of the existing state of things. In other words, is knows where all the moving parts are holistically and how they really kind of come together to form the enterprise systems that you're looking to build. And then can put funding and money into uh, projects that are going to pilot different ways of doing something and understanding that we're going to fail a few times before we succeed. So not, we're not going to Everybody moves toward this particular way of doing something. That's not going to work. It, it's the ability to, we have this vision for where we need to go, and we're going to fund this vision with different experiments we're going to put in place until we find something we believe is going to work, and then we're going to put it into operational stuff. And by the way, we're going to get feedback from everybody, and we're going to push it out if it doesn't seem to work over time, and also look and monitor it and ask kind of the core questions. I think the the big mistakes we're making now is lots of people who may make those decisions may do so from not the point of credibility. And so they're not followed within the organization. People slow lock, walk stuff. They're not really accustomed to, uh, to, to working somebody else's solution. Um, but, you know, foundational, this is about culture. Uh, this is about trust. Uh, and we're getting into some, you know, kind of areas that, uh, you know, sometimes I wish I got a psychology degree versus a computer <laughs> science degree, but, you're not going to have the ability to succeed unless you have those kind of things in place. And also you're not going to have the ability to succeed if you don't have the funding. So you should have the budget, the funding, the ability to experiment, the ability to fail many times, the ability to have lots of people to participate in making these decisions. And that's going to lead to a successful outcome. Awesome. No, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Um, the, the interesting thing, uh, we talking to a, a large uh, e-commerce uh, company and, Initially, we built kind of this, this this picture here with the Cloud Foundation. They built a self-service portal on top. Developers could just request, hey, this is me. I need access to this, this, and this. And the platform team would just magically make it happen, right? Initially, went down the path of just kind of dealing with apps. Then came kind of serverless function, right? And then, then came like these other things. And before you know it, the kind of this core team that was really involved in this was like 
eight people strong. We started with two and then it was like eight people, right? But it started to make sense because you're making a lot more impactful decisions on a, on a, on a day-to-day basis. So that's, that's a great insight that you have there. So um, Nathan, if you move to the, to the next one and then we'll, we'll wrap with this, um, uh, sorry, uh, go one more, uh, Nathan. So uh, at, at a high level, uh, what we hear from kind of cloud forward customers is, hey, you know what, my, my care about are these workloads. Uh, they could sit in one cloud, multiple clouds, I don't care. Uh, I'm, I'm going to choose the right cloud for the right workload. Uh, for a variety of reasons, maybe uh, I, I might be all in on, or maybe 80% of it in, in one cloud and then 20% sprinkled across uh, others. Uh, whether I'm multi-cloud, I think that's a terminology thing. I'm, I'm just going to choose the right workload for the, for the right cloud. I mean, who needs to access that? Apps need to talk to each other, hence the app to app. And users need to talk to the uh, application and so user to app, right? Um, and so they fundamentally agree on kind of the architectural way to solve this problem with all of these things remaining in my control is as important. The part that we see grapple with, and Nathan, if you go to uh, probably one more one more slide after this, uh, that the part where we've seen customers grapple with is like where to start. So there are multiple projects, right? Like, hey, I have my head of digital transformation that's saying go all in on cloud. I have kind of the security compliance thing. I have like an MA project. I have a B2B exchange I need to build. My developers need like velocity and this, that, and the other. I, I know this is not a, an easy one to answer. Like one is more important than the other, but there is also probably a wrong way to approach this. Any, any words of wisdom here, uh, David, on kind of where to start and how to proceed? Yeah, you put these in priority order for your particular organization. In other words, what's important and what's not, and also define what they are to you in terms of the as is state, as well as the vision where you're looking to move to. So um, this really doesn't necessarily mean you have to start in some particular order, but this is looking at where your current as is state is, what, what issues are probably more important to you, put them in priority order, but also have a core vision as to where you're looking to go. So everybody understands that we're looking to get to this direction in five years. This is something, even if, even if it changes over time, it's really important that people you know, understand what the business vision is going to be for these particular technologies. And then you know, pick a path and just go ahead and do it. Uh, wonderful. Um, parting thoughts, uh, David. If you, if the, if the audience here has to take like one or two things, what, what would you want them to take? Yeah, this is all about doing things. Number one, co- using commonality. Your ability to find common solutions are going to work across domains. We keep repeating that over and over again, but we've done such a poor job in building things in silos. And certainly, when I see the multi-cloud deployments out there, it's just silo city and their ability. Their everything's around cloud providers and data sets and things like that. And it's very difficult to get these things connected. And when there is networking things and they're just kind of running lines in between these various systems, it ends up being very inefficient, very expensive to run. And we kind of have to stop thinking about that. So think in terms of commonality. The other thing is, one of the things as an architect, you know, you should use uh, OPW, other people's work. And the ability and reinventing the wheel every time without looking at what technology is out there to bring in to solve these issues uh, it's just craziness. And we have a tendency to kind of want to piecemeal networking systems together, databases together, things like that. When there's lots of things that are going to be there that you're able to leverage that are repeatable solutions, you're able to bring into your domain for just a small fee that's going to pay for itself in a very short period of time. we got, we got to stop building our way uh, through every step of the way and just creating spaghetti and complexity moving forward. There has to be some commonality of systems as we find commonality Let's find common solutions that are able to fill that void. Awesome. That's wonderful. Um, thanks for sharing that uh, that wisdom, David. Uh, I, I would leave the audience with, with one thing. Uh, there are a bunch of care abouts that you have heard in this session, uh, all the way from kind of app diversity to, um, to what would care about of, on networking to organizational structures to kind of when to use cloud native to, to not and full stack and, and so forth. Uh, at a minimum, I would kind of just encourage the audience to look holistically at the picture, look at commonality, as David just mentioned, and see what makes sense on which cloud. And then uh, importantly, and most importantly, avoid the spaghetti mess. Um, many a times we get into a conversation where, first off, the cloud networking team, um, I, I feel for these guys, are usually the last ones to get pulled in. And when they get pulled, it is a mess already. And if you can 
shift left the engagement with the cloud networking teams please do that um and then uh, and then hopefully uh, things will be a lot cleaner uh, david as always appreciate the words of wisdom here and for sharing your wonderful thoughts and uh, with that we will conclude